Okay, I think a lot of people are hoping that the whole Kavanaugh saga is uh, drawing to a close. And as of this um, recording, the FBI presented its findings to Donald Trump. I don't know what those findings are. I don't know what anybody's expecting those findings to have been. And frankly, I think it was a, ma a massive waste of time uh, for a while over the past few days. Uh, you know, there's a friend of mine who discusses this pretty often, and we, we have like a back and forth, which is essentially two people that agree on the same thing. So it's not really that important. We, we, we both agreed that there's no, there's basically no soil to sustain the plant. If, if the plant would be an actual allegation that has the merit for an investigation. And I didn't think that there, you know, for example, we were discussing off the air, me and a, another friend of mine who's been on the show, on the live show, we were discussing allegations of Dr. Martin Luther King having affairs with women. And he was vehement that there was no way that he had affairs with women. It was an FBI smear and they were trying to catch him and, and uh, delegitimize him and divide the movement. And I said, look, I don't believe that the FBI's accounts about Martin Luther King were uh, very accurate. They were probably embellished, but it, you know, th the idea that Martin Luther King <laughs> did not have affairs because you don't want him, you don't want to accept that there were people around him who uh, fed information to the FBI that were uh, about actual affairs that he did have. You're just not willing to entertain the possibility because you think that that moral failing would tarnish his ethical standing in your mind now I didn't, I didn't really phrase it that way but that's that's kind of where the conversation was going that you can't just expect people who are uh, big cultural figures okay we're not talking about the Kavanaugh issue but big cultural figures you, you can't just deny literally uh, everything that that uh, you find distasteful about them because you hope that they're that they're not going to be the perfect person that you thought they that they were, or that it would legitimize certain problems that were created uh, unjustly towards them, like like what happened with Dr. King and the FBI. So I will say this: people who think that this is drawing to a close are are kind of wrong, and uh, I'll explain why. Uh, people might think that it's 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 like that scene from. Uh, you know, die hard when, uh, you know, the guy, uh, Car Carl Winslow's character, you know, the, the, the fat cop uh, comes over and they're, they're talking and, you know, Nakatomi Plaza has been rescued and everything. And John McCain has, or not, not John, uh, is it John McClain? I forgot. Yeah, it was something McClain. Uh, Bruce Willis's character is, is basically bloody, but he's triumphed over all of the terrorists and everything. That's not what's happening over here. In reality, you have basically like that scene from uh, like like Flash Gordon when there's that claw at the end and there's going to be a sequel. Well, in, in the case of Flash Gordon, I don't think there ever was a sequel. That, that movie was kind of dumb. But th there's going to be follow-up and more stuff like this, whether Kavanaugh gets confirmed or not. And at the moment, I don't know if he's going to get confirmed because, uh, you know, I was listening to the radio earlier on the way home from work, and there's all of these various senators on the GOP side that are, are probably floating back and forth. And, you know, of course, Jeff Flake, the dumbass, and Susan Collins and, and uh, Lisa Murkowski. So, so in reality, we don't know what the hell is going to go on. I don't know if he – I don't know that he will be confirmed. And uh, frankly, at this point, I think that the issue of, of who sits on the Supreme Court has taken a back seat in this argument, okay? The, ar the argument now is not whether this person is qualified to be on the Supreme Court. The argument is whether you require evidence and uh, substantiated allegations in order to in order to disqualify somebody from a position and potentially uh, have him fired from from um, a position that he already holds, 
That, that's really what the, the issue is. And therefore, you know, all of these toxic uh, effects, what I call the toxic cocktail, have really concentrated themselves in this one issue, the Kavanaugh uh, Supreme Court nomination. And they're all toxic issues that are, are within the progressive left. And, I'll, and And you know what? If people think I'm unfair about it, let me explain. Brett Kavanaugh had a lot of legitimate reasons why you would not want him on the Supreme Court related to uh, illegal search and seizures, related to habeas corpus, you know, the the inde indefinite detention, I, th I think it's is what it's called. And Tim Pool was discussing it a little bit earlier, and that was one of the reasons why I said, I don't really think this guy is good, okay? But instead of coming out and trying to, uh, you know, legitimately make make a solid case against him, the Democrats really screwed the pooch and they started on this campaign of personal, uh, basically, well, well, yeah, personal campaign against not only Brett Kavanaugh, but against their political opponents and the GOP, and they, they've made uh, they've made the GOP more sympathetic. Now, I, I happen to have been, again, okay, this is just me, uh, and maybe a few of my viewers. I, I was always a huge fan of Senator Rand Paul, uh, but the fact is that that now his wife has penned an op-ed for CNN, uh, claiming that her husband was besieged at the airport by activists. And you know, rudely uh, accosted and and uh, cursed out by them and whatever, which I, th I think is, I mean, that that's part of being a politician. Um, and she wrote that the protesters had heeded Booker's advice from July, in which he urged a nonprofit group in Washington D.C. to get up in the face of some Congress people rather than being passive about issues they care about. So if if you really read Booker's advice literally then she's exactly right. Now, it doesn't mean that Booker was specifically inciting against Rand Paul and, and his wife or anything. Uh, and the other thing is that she described in the, in the actual article, which I'm not going to show because, you know, screw CNN. I don't care if they published Rand Paul. Uh, and in my opinion, Rand Paul should have published his piece somewhere else because wh why would you even give CNN the, um, you know, why, why would you select them as the platform to deliver it. Nobody, nobody wants to read them and nobody wants to watch them. Um, Senator Brooker actually says to a nonpartisan nonprofit organization dedicated to ending homeless, homelessness to get up in the face of some congressmen and tell them about common sense solutions that address, that address this problem. And I don't want to hate anybody because I know the truth. Uh, to think Senator Brooker is somehow urging filing confrontation with these words requires you to ignore all context. Um, so I, I will say this, okay? I don't think that Cory Booker was necessarily inciting against Rand Paul, but the fact is that now, now Cory Booker is making these statements. Um, you can see here. Where, yeah, he says that you need to get rid of Kavanaugh, whether he's innocent or, or guilty. Okay? Let's see if... Here we go. This is from C-SPAN. So my hope is... And you see Dick Durbin right behind him. So it's not as if he's he's being completely... You know, it's not as if he's a he's a renegade Democrat here. That just beyond the vicious partisan rancor that is going on, beyond the accusations, we don't lose sight of what this moral moment is about in this country. And ultimately ask ourselves the question, is this the right person to sit on the highest court in the land for a lifetime appointment when their credibility has been challenged by intimates, people that knew the candidate well as a classmate? when his temperament has been revealed in an emotional moment where he used language that, that frankly shocked a lot of us. And then ultimately, not whether he's innocent or guilty, this is not a trial, but ultimately, have enough questions be raised 
that we should not move on to another candidate. And that long list put together by the Heritage Foundation and the Federalist Society, move on to another candidate because ultimately the Supreme Court is not an entitlement. Just because you went to Yale or were president of your class doesn't entitle you to the Supreme Court. This is a sacred institution. And the people that should be on it, whether you disagree with their political or judicial philosophy at all, the people who should be on the Supreme Court should preserve the integrity of the court and be beyond the reproach of these difficult partisan times. Okay, I'll, I'll say this. If you take, if you take Cory Booker at his word and, and just isolate the context of this video, Sure, sure. He he doesn't he doesn't say anything that's wrong, and you know he's he's not saying that, um, you know the the issue of Kavanaugh's sexual assault allegations are the only issue, which I I think I think that that was a valid point in what he said, but what he does say is the is the total bullshit of this, which is that he's claiming this is a moral moment, and what's what's really the issue is not. The, the, the moral moment is not on Brett Kavanaugh if he cannot be proven to have sexually assaulted anybody. The moral moment is on the people who decided uh, prematurely that they were going to vote against him. They, they never gave him a fair uh, hearing. They never entertained the notion that he could be voted on to the Supreme Court. I'm not saying that they, they shouldn't have said after the hearing, well, we're going to vote against him because we don't like his stance on you know, pineapple pizza or something. Uh, the, the, the reality is that they never extended to him the courtesy of believing that he could be a Supreme Court judge to begin with. So uh, if you think that his temperament and the issues of, of things that people that he knew back in college and high school are really the issues, then uh, uh, look, your temperament your temperament, especially Cory Booker, but but not not limited to Cory Booker. I'd say Sheldon Whitehouse and some of the other senators, th their own temperament uh, kind of changed Kavanaugh's temperament. Okay, and that that was their game plan. And if, if you think that that was a valid course of action, then I think they succeeded because they took somebody who was kind of a gray, uh, a very uninteresting person. And in reality, he isn't really that interesting, Brett Kavanaugh. If you examine his life, he is a boring and tiresome person. And, um, you know, I don't have anything against him personally. I'm just saying I, I'm not blown away for, by him like some of these idiots on the radio or whatever saying, oh, he's an amazing judge or whatever. Th this is a person who is uh, actually unusually suited to be on a, a, a federal court or on the Supreme Court. Because it's it's the type of personality you would expect. No, nobody was really uh, swept off their feet by the personality of any of Obama's judges. If you're talking about Kagan and Sotomayor, except people who who are fucking, um, you, you know, they'll basically lick any dollop of cream they you put in their bowls from Obama. And the same thing, by the way, for these Republicans who are. You know, they, they basically kissed Scalia's ass his entire time in the court. So that that's all bullshit. The temperament is, is a nonsense story because the reality is that his temperament, until they basically, uh, use, they, they basically revealed something about themselves, Cory Booker and um, Sheldon Whitehouse and R Richard Blumenthal and Dianne Feinstein, and, and the other various members of the committee, Harris and, and whatever, and Hirano, they, they revealed their own personalities and they created an atmosphere where they drew, they, they kind of created a mirror image of themselves in Kavanaugh, you know, with this, this allegation that they, they that eventually was leaked out of there by uh, somebody. And, and by the way, so, so, okay, let me just finish this point. What they did was they, they, they took the hearing from being a hearing about this person's career into being a, a hearing about this person's, uh, you, you know, a sordid history that uh, somebody had suddenly, uh, you know, unearthed from nowhere after so many years or something. So that they're, they're really the people who changed the temperament of the hearing. They changed the temperament of the Senate. 
And now they're going to be changing the temperament of the Supreme Court. So no, Kavanaugh is not over. The Kavanaugh issue will probably live for years as a black mark on the history of this country. On the, uh, uh, we as all Americans, whether you're a Mexican American or uh, I don't know, a German American or like me, a Jewish American or Iraqi American like me. <laughs> so you, you have to, okay, maybe, maybe you don't have to dwell on it, but I'm saying that this, this is kind of an issue that will live in, this is a day that will live in infamy. It was, is a time that will leave, live in infamy because of the way that our leaders have behaved. And yes, even the ones that we hate are our leaders, unfortunately. Uh, now, let me talk about the leaking. The one theory that I haven't heard anybody propose was how it got leaked from uh, Dianne Feinstein, but not necessarily by members of her staff, the, the letter, the anonymous letter. And what I really think happened, if you want to listen, is that uh, they recommended, you have, to re recommend, you have to remember that from the testimony, she said that uh, Christine Ford stated that her legal counsel, Deborah Katz, had been recommended to her by Dianne Feinstein. And we are aware that Dianne Feinstein has claimed that it wasn't her people that leaked the letter to the press. But what if, <laughs> what if, what if, what if, what if, they didn't leak it to the press, but they, you know, obviously they have a connection to this lawyer and her, and her law firm, Deborah Katz, and they sent the letter to the law firm. And then by some sort of uh, a voluntary action of some sort, uh, the law firm leaked the letter to the press, and that's how it got out. So technically, it's not Diane Feinstein. Technically, you know, they could have uh, had Christine Ford, you know, because obviously Christine Ford wanted legal re or or was offered legal representation advice from Diane Feinstein's office. So you you have a relationship between those three parties, Christine Ford. Uh, Deborah Katz attorneys or whatever her, her law firm is and Diane Feinstein uh, yeah it's it's uh, it's definitely a possibility and then and then she could very honestly say Feinstein could say well I, I didn't leak the letter I, I did forward the letter to her lawyers so she could they could prepare for whatever the fuck that they were they were gonna do even though she said she was gonna be anonymous but I mean it's not my business what they do with it it's it's basically, you know, it's 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 a it's a smart move, but it's a dirty move, and and that's what I believe happened. And you know, it it could be something else. It could be that Feinstein's office directly did leak it, and it could be that Anna Shu, the Congresswoman's office, did leak it. But yeah, there there's a lot of uh, bad blood going on here. Um, you have this guy. Um, Jackson Costco kind of makes me want to go out to Costco and buy some uh, tires. This is the congressional aide that has been arrested on behalf <laughs> by, by the uh, Capitol Police for doxing Republican members of Congress. Uh, and he's he's worked for a number of uh, Congress people, including Maggie Hassan of uh, the, the senator from New Hampshire Barbara Boxer of California, uh, Diane Feinstein as an intern, and uh, now works for Sheila Jackson Lee. And um, she is, uh, she's fired him apparently now. And then an another person who had worked for Maggie Hassan was uh, suspended for shouting fuck you at Trump. Uh, so, so these people are not, look, if you work in the halls of Congress and you're behaving like this, then, uh, uh look, eventually if you're doing things that are, are, are literally illegal and you're saying, well, the, the Supreme court is important enough that we have to take these risks, etc. No, uh, you, you don't realize what you just did. Okay. The premise of these hearings, the premise of this entire process is to provide somebody who will be. Um, able to best, uh, you know, interpret the law of our country. 
And if you are breaking laws in the process of trying to prevent him from getting onto the court, you're, you're effectively invalidating your argument because you're trying to say, I have such an objection to somebody's interpretation of the law that I'm willing to go and, and, and say, fuck the law in order to prevent them from getting onto it. Yeah, that's, that's basically what, it's, what it is. It would be like somebody objecting to, uh, you know, the, can the, you know, the competitors in a pie eating contest and saying, fuck you all. I'm going to sit here and eat a bunch of, uh, I don't know, plantains or, or I do like those plantain chips. I don't know why I thought of those, but yeah, yeah people would be like, well, uh, who gives a shit what you think? Uh, and that's basically what this person should be. Uh, and by the way, yes, I'm not diminishing the fact that as a crime, this is pretty dangerous because I am referring here back to the Rand Paul example, which I think I think you can, you can say this is where I'll be lenient with Cory Booker. I don't believe he was trying to get people to harass uh, people like Rand Paul or anybody else. But <laughs> the fact of the matter is that he was almost shot last year by that assassin James Hodgkinson during the congressional baseball game, you know, during the Steve Scalise shoot, shooting, he was one of the other people that was there. So by, by you know, the fortune of the fact that Scalise had a security detail, he, he probably would have, you know, otherwise he probably would have, would have been either wounded or killed. Uh, so that happened and then he was assaulted at his home in Kentucky by a neighbor and there, there are um, accounts that it was for a political reason. So, you know, I, I don't think this is a laughing matter in his case anymore, especially if you're talking about a guy who, who's one of, he's one of the younger senators so, and he does have uh, children that are of school age that live with him, him and his wife and everything. This isn't somebody who, you, you know, let's say somebody were to murder one of the older Congress people. Uh, yeah, it would be a major story and everything. But um, really what we're talking about here is somebody who is actually, uh, yeah, you're talking about familial distress. Now, and, and by the way, with an older person, uh, yeah, their grandchildren or their or, or other family members, they could be threatened too. Uh, so I don't think that, and in any case, I don't think it's a good idea for, um, you know, any of our, our uh, legislators to be living in, in physical fear of their lives. Okay, and, and by the way, for those progressives that think that <laughs> attacking Rand Paul would be a good idea, this is one of the most anti-interventionist, uh, you know, elected officials we have in Washington and that we've had in a long time. So they're, they're actually defeating their case. And then you have this person who was just arrested, apparently, for uh, trying to, to mail rice into Donald Trump and... Uh, <coughs> I don't know if this is the same person who mailed the substance to Jim, uh, Jim Mattis, James Mattis, who is the Secretary of Defense. Um, yeah, that, it's the same guy. So, so you you have this person, and we don't know what the political reason is because you know this guy's a U.S. Navy veteran from Utah has a criminal record related to child abuse, apparently. So um, th this could be for any any sort of reason, who knows? And um, well, what are we supposed to make of it? I don't know, but but it's all happening at the same time. Meanwhile, you have this, uh, you have this bright, shiny bulb attracting all the moths. I would love to get inaugurated January 3rd, January 4th. We're signing the health care, we're signing this, we're decarcerating our society. But, but really, it is that we have a duty to always fight and maintain the strength of our values. Okay, so she would love to be inaugurated if she wins her congressional race here in New York. But they don't actually inaugurate Congress people. They swear, swear them in. in. That was Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who was talking about the 
process and she hopes to be inaugurated. Yes, the president's the only one out of three branches of government that gets inaugurated. They, uh, the people of Congress get sworn into office. And then she went on to say that she was going to get inaugurated on the 3rd and then start signing bills on the 4th. And so people are being critical of her saying she doesn't understand government. You don't get inaugurated and you don't sign bills. Only the president will sign the bills that you present to him. Well, uh, she's she's got her uh, view of how things work. We have Okay, um, who cares what, uh, so Fox and Friends says this, and, and, uh, I want people to realize that, you know, there, there's, there are issues here, okay? So first of all, um, should, should Ocasio-Cortez be completely raked over the coals for this? Yes and no. <laughs> so, so no, not completely. Uh, no, she should not be because ultimately... When Ocasio-Cortez gets elected to Congress, you guys have to understand this, okay? You people who might be saying, well, she doesn't deserve to be in it. Well, she will be one of the youngest members, and she will be one of the least senior members because, of course, she's she's a freshman and everything. So uh, if you're one of these people that says, well, she doesn't know what the hell she's doing, uh, a lot of people get elected to Congress who are we, – we don't know who the hell they are. And uh, it and and that might be a reflection of why we're so screwed. So why why should Ocasio Cortez be judged any worse than they are? But she should be raked over the coals for the following reason: uh, she is a person who is being called the future of the Democratic Party by the chair Tom Perez, and uh, she's also revealing how shallow her understanding of the political process is. Uh, the legislative branch uh, drafts and votes on laws, and if they are passed in both houses, they go to the president to be signed or vetoed, and then th they can be, of course, challenged in the courts and then overturned or whatever. Uh, that, in, in less than a minute, is the way the government works. Uh, what Ocasio-Cortez said here what was, was, yeah, it was, it was bullshit. It, it has nothing to do with reality. Uh, and um, I'm sorry for people who are, you, you know, kissing her ass. But, uh, yes, Ocasio-Cortez has displayed a remarkable amount of ignorance throughout this entire election season. And she's, al she's also shown how shallow she is both towards people who are average voters and, and towards progressives because – She's flip-flopped a number of times. Of course, there were there were the progressives who were pissed off about her Palestine flip-flop. Uh, newsflash, people, when you're a freshman congressman, uh, you can change very little in terms of foreign policy, okay? Now, what I will say is that, that the Democrats are approaching a critical mass of people, eventually, that will be able to dramatically shift the party's policies in respect to that issue, okay? So th those of you that think that Palestine and Israel is a massive issue if you're in the Democratic Party, uh, look, Ocasio-Cortez getting elected is, is a very small step in that direction, but there are other small steps being made at the same time. So um, I don't know why they're so bent out of shape. Uh, we'll, we'll probably see what happens when she gets into Congress, which she's going, she is going to get elected, in my opinion. Uh, the other issue that we're seeing is that, you know, they're claiming, they're claiming uh, a lot of uh, victories because of, this was another story that was related to her. Um, so... She tweeted out this where they were told that Amazon... We are also establishing a new Amazon minimum wage of $15 a month. I would say, yeah, that's, a, that's an accomplishment for the progressives and everything, but um, they're, they're, it's never going to be enough. And you already see people here. It says, wow, y'all really falling for this, huh? Amazon is making its current employees pay for this new minimum wage by taking away stock and variable compensation. Basically, if you have worked at Amazon for more than two years, you're now making less money. Wow, I knew it was a brilliant move. 
so somebody's this is an Amazon worker who has a very weird face and she says with previous raises and working nights I'm already at $15 so I gain no hourly wage I lose my ver my VCP uh, so that's variable compensation I'm one of those ones who I don't I don't use my UPT unpaid uh, let me see UPT is um, I don't remember what that is so this is going to hit me hard we don't get new stock every year like before and new employees it will be different than ones there already um, so so you have people that are gonna be negatively impacted by this change because uh, look you can you can demand things from Amazon and they can give it to you but you cannot tell Amazon how to run their company ultimately if it, if it comes to the point where these progressives are going to dictate things that change Amazon's corporate policies such as they can't run a profit then uh, people will will probably end up having a backlash against these progressives because uh, you know these progressives are not paying their bills Amazon is unfortunately unfortunately they work for Amazon I'm not trying to defend Amazon I think that there, there's there's good things I like about Amazon and then of course a lot of these uh, policies that are, are talked about by progressives I don't think that that I really I don't, I don't think that I, I can really stand by Amazon being a great company but uh, what would I lie to you and say I don't use it uh, I do use it and I'm not going to um, I'm not going to claim that there's that there's a better service out there because they're doing very well. <laughs> Even if you think Jack, uh, what's his name? Jeff Bezos is the is evil incarnate. So in any case, I think that we've covered a number of topics here that, and you can see that this this is basically Ocasio Cortez um, engaging in stuff that has nothing to do with uh, writing and, and drafting laws. Um, <laughs> so that, that, that's really what her candidacy is about. And that, that's, that's the temperament of people that we're sending to Congress, which I guess is fine. It's, it's okay for people to, you know, engage with their, their constituents. But th this is, this is, again, this is a person who does not, does not know what the fuck she's talking about. She doesn't, she does not. Uh, and and she's she's here talking about needing protected status for Haitians, Salvadorans, Nicaraguans, and Sudanese. Well, well, Ocasio Cortez, how about you figure out why it is that we have to pick up the slack for their shitty governments? Okay. Uh, yes, I'm against interventionism too. I don't want us to be sending troops back to Haiti. How about you ask the president who sent our troops to Haiti? Uh-huh. That you know who he is. The president who sent our tr troops to Haiti was President Clinton. Would that ingratiate you with would it ingratiate you with the, with the with the Democratic Party? I don't think so. So she's not going to talk about that. So ultimately, here's what I think. The Kavanaugh saga is not the is not over and it's it's just opening a newer and uglier and more bitter chapter in American public discourse. And, and we're really looking at a country that is almost irreversibly divided. The people who believe the accusers in this case, uh, in my opinion, will never, ever, ever uh, entertain the notion that <coughs> they needed to prove what they were talking about. And <coughs> likewise, the people that believed in his innocence who I happen to be one of the people that I, I never really believed the accusers, but I don't, I don't know Kavanaugh. I don't, I don't claim that he's the greatest guy ever, like some of these morons do. But <coughs> there's a lot of people who were, who were basically saying, well, there's no way that he could have raped anybody. Well, well, no, yes, there is a way. And you do have to assess the veracity of claims in order to be absolutely sure that you're not putting somebody on the court who could be, you know, a real liability for our country uh, going ahead. But they never did prove anything. The, the, the allegations went nowhere. And the campaign to make the allegations stick has basically created a Democratic Party image 
that I, I believe will tarnish it for years to come. And, you know, it, it will, in some parts of the country, I'm not going to say it's going to cripple the Democrats across the board, but if, if you will go to certain states in this country, like Missouri, <coughs> like, um, you know, st other states that Donald Trump did very, very well in, and uh, you, you will see the Democratic Party will be a shadow of its former self because people will simply say, well, there's no credibility there. It's not even about the ideas. It's about the credibility. And that's about it. Uh, I think I went a little too long on this one. We'll see if it even uploads to BitChute, which if it doesn't, I might have to do it manually. But uh, have a great time tomorrow uh, being Thursday. And I will talk to you guys later. Uh, please like the video, subscribe to the channel, subscribe to the other channel, Razor Ray Live Wounds, and also comment when the video uploads.